Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson. Welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. Now, over the past few sessions, we have been surveying various claims that have been made by pre-tribulational teachers, wherein they have claimed to have found pre-tribulational statements in the writings of the early church, the early church fathers, the early church writers, and we've been systematically going through each one of these claims and showing that not a single one of them are valid. Not a single one of them actually teach or even support a pre-tribulational rapture. There is not a single pre-tribulational statement made at any time. It's not even debatable up until, I'm going to say, the 14th century. Um, we'll discuss later um, some alleged statements that were made by a, name, by a man named Brother Dolcino. Okay, but well over a thousand years, you will not find a single statement in the writings of the early church fathers. As I have repeatedly said, that has not stopped many pre-tribulational teachers from making these false claims. And these false claims are circulating all over the internet and even in books, even in academic works. And so it's for this reason that we've taken the time to systematically go through each one of these claims and to debunk them. Now, we've actually gotten to the part um, in the series where we're going to critique three different books. Okay, so thus far we've been looking at the claims of three different teachers, Ken Johnson, Mike Golay, and Lee Brainerd. Now, to be clear, these guys are they're teachers, okay? None of them are scholars, none of them are academics. Um, they're sort of just lay leaders like myself. However, there are actually three different academic books, or I'm going to say one of them is actually academic, one sort of pretends to be academic, or I guess all three pretend to be academic. Um, but in these three books, um, you have various credentialed scholars who claim to have found all sorts of support for the pre-tribulational rapture in history. Uh, the first book that we're going to look at is called Ancient Dispensational Truth by author James Morris. Um, this is the least academic of all of the books, and we're going to spend the least amount of time on that. The next one that we're going to look at is called Dispensationalism Before Darby by William C. Watson. We're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, surveying, reviewing, and critiquing, and quite frankly, debunking many of the claims that um, Mr. Watson makes. And then finally, we're going to look at a new book, which literally just was released this week. I just got this this week, and it's called Discovering Dispensationalism. And this book is comprised, what it is essentially is each chapter has a different contributor. Okay, so you've got all sorts of different contributing academics, and overall, um, the pre-tribulational rapture plays a relatively smaller role um, in the overall book, but unfortunately the portion um, wherein the pre-tribulational rapture is, is um, focused on is written, again, by William C. Watson, the author of Dispensationalism Before Darby, which, uh, as we'll see, his work is saturated with errors, with historical errors, with category uh, errors, and even at times, quite frankly, flat-out deception, dishonest uh, quote, citation, and editing of different quotes, and this sort of thing, which we'll see. Now, all that said, before we jump in, because I know my audience, because I know many of you, you know, you're not academics, you're not reading theological books and literature all the time, you know, you just, uh, and, and that's not a put-down, I'm an average Christian, I just have a weird fascination with theology, um, so understanding my audience, before I jump into the critique of these books, I thought it was necessary, and actually I think it's going to be super helpful, to do a simple overview to help people understand what in the world is dispensationalism. You know, oftentimes throughout this series, you've heard me mention dispensationalism because the term pre-tribulational dispensationalism is a, a term that's very commonly used. It's a, um, a, a system of theology that's very commonly embraced in very large segments of the church. And in order to understand the problem with the pre-tribulational rapture, we have to understand dispensationalism. What is it, and why do I, why do I have such a problem with it? Okay, so hopefully in this session, Again, for those of you who are not, you know, ridiculous theology 
nerds, um, we can present sort of an overview of different end time perspectives or different eschatological perspectives, and everyone can understand this, that we can present it in a very simplified way. So I'm calling this particular session, What is Dispensationalism and Why It Must Die? That's a pretty strong statement. Um, it sounds very adversarial and hostile, and I want to assure you it's not. I'm actually fairly close to being a dispensationalist myself, very close to being a progressive dispensationalist, and I think even those who are progressive dispensationalists, or at least some, would say, no, Joel, you are a dispensationalist. But the reality is I have always said, no, I'm not a dispensationalist. Rather, I, am a his I hold to what's called historical premillennialism. Or sometimes um, I'll even, you'll hear me say, apostolic premillennialism. Okay, so you go, well, what's the difference? Okay, again, these are all big terms that, you know, as soon as you start using these terms, you lose most people. So we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to essentially survey church history to understand the different primary views concerning the last days that have been embraced by the church. And before I begin, I want to be very clear, this is a drastic oversimplification um, of these issues. We could spend, you know, we could do a whole 10-session class just on this, but I'm trying to simplify it and reduce it down to one session. So what is dispensationalism and why it must die? Okay, so first of all, we're going to begin with a chart here. At the top, you can see I just have the term Jewish apocalyptic. Now, what do I mean by that? Jewish apocalyptic is a very simplified term to express a particular view of history. It's not just a view of the past, it's also a view of the future. And this is the view that's, this term, by the way, is often used by scholars, by academics. They refer to this worldview as Jewish apocalyptic. And in the most simplified form, Jewish apocalyptic, again, rooted in the scriptures, rooted primarily in the Old and New Testaments, it views all of the history and the future as broken up into two periods. Very simple. Okay, so as you can see, you've got this chart, you have this age, that's the age that we're in, and then there is a specific day the Bible refers to called the Day of the Lord. Now, sometimes the Day of the Lord is um, described as a single day, other times it's a period, other times it's a fairly broad period. But the Day of the Lord is the defining line between this age and then what's called the age to come. In Hebrew, you'll hear the term... Um, Haba Olam, or Olam Haba, Haba Olam, the age to come, okay? So really, you have this age and the age to come. Now, to be clear, from a biblical perspective, this age is corrupt. This age is broken. This age, things are fallen, okay? There's all sorts of different reasons why the world is messed up right now. But the age to come will be the age of redemption, the age of the resurrection, the messianic age, okay? Things will be restored, renewed, healed, redeemed in the age to come. So just a very simple, again, linear view of the world. History is proceeding forward, and it has a destination. It's not just this sort of endless, uh, cyclical, repeat of events. There, there's a degree to where things do repeat, but they're moving forward. And we're moving forward toward, all of history is barreling toward the day of the Lord and the age to come. Now, again, that's a very, and I would even say oversimplified understanding of these things. Now, Jewish apocalyptic has a few, we're not going to review them all, but a few very distinct um, beliefs uh, attached to it. The first of which is that in the age to come, Israel, as a nation, will be completely delivered from her enemies, that her Messiah will return and restore the fallen throne of David, that Israel's Messiah and her king will return and deliver Israel from the oppression of the Gentiles, that Israel will be exalted among the nations. This is a very basic feature of Jewish apocalyptic. So just as one uh, passage to serve as an example, uh, for this particular view, we have Luke 1, 68 through 75. Now, what's so fascinating about this, this is a statement, uh, an exclamation, if you will, of uh, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. 
So he's serving in the temple. We know the story. And he, he rejoices when he comes to believe that the Messiah is about to be born. And so here is the, the offering of praise that he leaves us. But in this, we can see, because this is in the New Testament, we can see what the common Jewish expectation was. We can see what the common expectation was of those who knew and were familiar with the scriptures, with the promises of God. What does Zechariah say? He says, blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. Now, again, he uses present tense terms. Uh, he uses actually complete terms, speaking of future realities. And this is very common throughout the scriptures. It, they speak of things in the future as though they already are, not because they actually already are, but because they are as good as done. They are guaranteed. So he says, blessed be the Lord, he has visited his people. And then it says this, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, just as he spoke by the mouths of the holy prophets. I love that statement because he's saying, this is not just something I'm hoping for. This is what God has specifically promised through his prophets. And then he says this, this is what the promises are. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of everyone who hates us. So what is history moving toward? What is it all barreling toward? What does biblical hope and expectation lead people who are familiar with these promises to believe and embrace and hope and long for? Israel would be delivered from the hand of all of her enemies and those who hate them. He goes on, he says, he has dealt mercifully with our fathers, with our ancestors. He has remembered his holy covenant that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham. And then here, here again, he reiterates the promise. He reiterates the expectation. He has given us the privilege, since we have been rescued from the hand of our enemies, to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. So the idea is, God, you set us free from all of our enemies in order that we can worship you with purity before you all our days, that you'd give us peace, that we can just worship you. So that is Jewish expectation articulated by the father of John the Baptist. So here I've got another chart, and it's no different than the first chart, except I've put in a little uh, graphic there where you can see that the age to come is the age of the renewal of the kingdom of David. It's the renewal of the Jewish kingdom. It's the renewal of what Christians, we refer to it as the Messianic age. Okay, so this is, again, just sort of a simple overview of a Jewish apocalyptic framework. We want to interrupt the Maranatha Global Bible Study for one minute to say this. Our primary burden as an organization is not teaching the Bible to people who have the Bible. Our primary burden as a spiritual family is to declare the name among those who've never heard the name. Romans 15 is our driving passion as an organization to not build on another man's foundation and to lay foundations where there are none. If this is something that resonates with you, if you care about the Great Commission, if you care about the Maranatha message taking root where it's never been declared before, I want to ask you to consider becoming a financial supporter of FAI Studios at a monthly level. We're doing this thing until the sky splits and we're committed to laboring on frontier fields where there are no foundations and where there are no workers. And this is a very costly task and we need your help if you care about this. So if you do, click on the link below or go to faistudios.org or you can give through the FAI app as well, safely and securely. Thanks for watching this, guys. Now back to the teaching. Now here's another statement in Isaiah 66. When God comes from heaven... He would come in blazing fire to execute vengeance against Israel's enemies. The Lord says, so I will comfort you. I will. The day is coming when I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. That Jerusalem is a term which embodies the future comfort that God will bring when he delivers Israel from her enemies. And of course, the king and the Messiah will actually be present in Jerusalem. He says, and then you will see and you will rejoice. You will flourish like the grass. Then the Lord's power will be revealed to his servants. On the other hand, he will show wrath against his enemies. 
Behold, look, the Lord will come with fire. Heaven opens and the Lord comes in blazing fire, according to the biblical narrative. His chariots are like the whirlwind. He is coming for what? To execute his anger with fury, his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment on all humanity with his fiery sword, and those who are slain by the Lord will be many. So he's coming back to judge the wicked and to reward and save and deliver his people. Okay, these are basic elements and expectations of Jewish apocalyptic literature. And this is very important. Um, well, I say Jewish apocalyptic worldview, which is also often articulated in Jewish apocalyptic literature. This is very helpful when we survey different Christian views um, of the end times, and we see that many people don't believe this. They go, oh, that's all allegorical, or that was all um, spiritually fulfilled in 70 AD, or this type of thing. No, the scriptures are clear. He will literally come back from heaven in blazing fire and literally judge the nations and deliver Israel from the hand of her enemies. And so here's another chart, very simple. The Lord, at the day of the Lord, God will come from heaven in fire and then establish the kingdom of God on the earth. Now, to use another term, I'm going to use the term premillennialism. Now, premillennialism, what is premillennialism? Premillennialism is simply Jewish apocalyptic framework applied to a Christian understanding. So what's the difference between a Christian and a Jew, or at least what should be the difference? Well, Christians believe the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. They believe that Yeshua, the son of Joseph and Mary from Nazareth, okay, that he is the Messiah. So looking at this chart, it's no different than Jewish apocalyptic. It's just that we believe that during this age, Jesus has come, the first coming, the incarnation, and he ascended into heaven. And he is coming back at the day of the Lord as Yahweh God Almighty, okay, in blazing fire, that all of the Old Testament promises about God coming from heaven in fire, the New Testament recognizes that that's actually Jesus, the Messiah, who will come back. And then, of course, the age to come, it's broken up between two different periods. One, the first period is called the millennium. And then after a thousand years of Jesus literally ruling and reigning on the earth, things transition into what Christians often refer to as the new heavens and the new earth or the eternal state. Um, and that really, in many ways, it's even better than the millennium, but it's very similar to the millennium. And that's when things are absolutely made perfect. So this is the chart, if you will, of premillennialism. Premillennialism is simply Christian Jewish apocalyptic perspective on uh, human history. Now, what does the word pre-millennialism mean? It's very simple. It means that Jesus will return before the millennium, pre, previous to the millennium. Okay, so you have this age, the day of the Lord, and then you have the millennium. Jesus will return before the millennial reign of Jesus, the Messiah, and the King of Israel. Okay, the millennium is literal. Jesus comes back previous to, before it. That's pre-millennialism. Very simple. Now, to be clear, most of the earliest of the early church fathers, the early church after the apostles, the apostles, of course, were Jewish. They believed and taught and expressed Jewish apocalypticism which is, again, Christian premillennialism, all right? However, those that came after the apostles, all of the earliest of the early church writers, they were also overwhelmingly premillennialists, okay? They believed in a literal future 1,000-year reign of Jesus on the earth. And you have many examples of premillennialism throughout history, but again, it was the dominant view of the earliest of the early church. And these include different early church writers such as Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Tertullian, Lactantius, Victorinus, okay, some of the Latin writers that came a few hundred years later. And so then I've got a chart here, and I find this chart to be very helpful. So it starts in the first century. It goes all the way up to our time, to the 21st century. We're just at the beginning of the 21st century. And as you can see, for the first 300 years plus 
of the early church, the dominant eschatology, the dominant view concerning the future, the dominant view concerning the return of Jesus, the dominant view concerning the last days was what's called historical or historic premillennialism. And the word historic is simply used to say that's what the earliest of the early church fathers believed. Very simple. The early view concerning the end times of the early church of both the apostles and those who came after the apostles for the first few hundred years was pre-millennialism. So you go, what happened? How did the church get off? If that's what the Bible teaches, how did they get off? And quite frankly, and this is so important for every Christian to understand, every Protestant has some type of a paradigm that says at some point in history the church stumbled. Otherwise, there would be no need for a reformation. The church got off track, right? But the question is always, at what point did they get off track? How did they get off track? Where did they get off track? How can we go back in history and say, here's where they really got off track? And to simplify this, again, there's going to be a wide range of different opinions, but the, the sort of mainstream evangelical perspective of, I'll just say my perspective, of premillennialists, is that very early on, particularly after the Jerusalem persecution, the Jerusalem dispersion, the persecution that came to the early apostolic church when the, apost the apostles were um, leading the church from Jerusalem and then they were persecuted and scattered all over the world, what happened was from that point forward, things started changing, which is to say that the church became dominated by Gentile leaders, that many of the leaders that came into the church were Gentiles, which is to say they were not familiar with the Old Testament. They were reading the writings of the apostles. They started studying the, the Bible, of course, but for the most part, they tended to be very Old Testament illiterate. And, of course, they brought with them typical Gentile arrogance. Um, you know, they have it all figured out. They understand everything. And they just kind of begin to in, essentially embrace Jewish views and add it to their own pagan worldviews, which were often uh, very much influenced by Greek, uh, the Greek philosophical worldview, which is quite different than the Hebrew or biblical worldview. Okay, so as the Gentiles came in, they started, quite frankly, leaving behind many of the um, biblical or Jewish elements of the faith. Okay, so the view that the church, this sort of new body of believers, has replaced Israel, i.e. replacement theology, that God is done with Israel, he's now moved on to a new people, this began to be taught very early on. And if you've never done a real uh, thorough study of this, in my book, When a Jew Rules the World, I have two chapters in which I survey the, uh, the creeping replacement theology or supersessionism and I go through and I show how it crept in very early, and I show how this particular belief led to a long history of Christians mistreating the Jewish people, sometimes in horrific, horrific ways, ultimately even leading up to and preparing um, the way for the Holocaust itself. And it's a, it's a part of history that every Christian should be aware of. So my book, When a Jew Rules the World, um, which is, by the way, free on both the FAI uh, website as well as my own website, joelstrumpet.com. So they taught that Israel was rejected, whereas the church is now the recipient of God's favor and blessings. Okay, so replacement theology started creeping in early. Well, how did that affect their perspective concerning the last days? Well, beyond replacement theology creeping in, many of the early church writers began to begin, become very influential were the church fathers who were from Alexandria. So you'll often see different individuals. They'll say, this guy is Clement of Alexandria. Now, Alexandria, of course, is the city there right on the coast of the Mediterranean in Egypt, and it's across from what? Greece. And it was a hot spot of Greek philosophical education. So many people would go there to Alexandria to study Greek philosophy. Okay, so you had many of the early church uh, leaders who became Christians, but they retained and they maintained a lot of that Greek philo philosophy. Now, Greek philosophy and Gnosticism and these different type of things, Platonism, um, they, there's a range of different views here. Okay, so I don't want to oversimplify it, but I will attempt to simplify it and say this. 
Greek philosophy essentially views you have the heavens above, which Greek philosophy views the heavens as spiritual or immaterial. In other words, people who live there are like spirits or ghosts, right? You can put your hand right through them. They, there's no substance. There's no physicality to them. And then down below, you have the earth. And down here on the earth, there is physicality. We have bodies. Greek philosophy essentially says that the earth is bad. It's corrupt. It's messed up. But once we escape this earth and become spirit and enter the heavens or the spiritual realm, that we become perfect, okay? That that place is pure. So the heavens or the spiritual realm is good. The earth is bad. Now, what's the difference between Greek philosophy and a biblical worldview? Well, the very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? The heavens, plural, and the earth, and they're all good. The heavens are good. The earth is good. Further, from a biblical worldview, the Bible says that in the heavens, the heavens are both physical and spiritual. Yes, they're spiritual, but they're also physical. There's thrones. I mean, there's things there. There's substance to it. The earth, likewise, is both physical and spiritual. Now, we don't understand the science. We don't understand the physics, the difference between the place where God dwells and the earth. What we do know is that in the Bible, angels come down from there. Whatever that word means, come down. And they appear and they actually eat food. Think about that. Beings from that place eat food, and they don't just temporarily take on substance to deceive or confuse us. No, somehow they just translate from there to here, and then they have the ability to eat food. And then they beat Jacob up, you know, they wrestle, and then they disappear through a wall. Okay, are they faster than, like, again, we don't understand the physics of it, but from a biblical perspective, the heavens are physical and spiritual. The earth is spiritual and physical, and presently they're all corrupted. There is actual corruption in the heavens and on the earth, and after the day of the Lord, they all, in Christ, will all be redeemed. They all will be restored to their original design in the beginning. Again, Genesis 1-1, bara bara sheet, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and they were good. And when all is said and done, he will restore Eden. He will restore things as they were at the beginning. Okay, so with all that said, the idea that the day of the Lord is going to come, God's going to come down from heaven, and there's going to be this godly kingdom on the earth, that conflicts with Greek philosophy. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, many of these teachers that began leading the church, they were poisoned, they were influenced, they were under the influence of pagan Greek philosophy, and it's in conflict with the biblical worldview. All right, so very early on, these different ideas began creeping into the church. You see them early on in the writings of, as I said, Clement of Alexandria. Origen was a huge allegorist. He hardly ever takes things literally in the Bible because it conflicts with his Greek-influenced worldview. And then ultimately, under Augustine or Augustine, from that point forward, he was such a looming figure in the church with such influence. From that point forward, the church left behind premillennialism. I don't say they completely left it behind, but for the most part, those who believed not in a literal millennium, not in a literal physical reign of the Messiah on the earth, they started embracing a spiritual millennium or a, an allegorical millennium, and this is what we refer to as amillennialism or for our British friends, amillennialism. Okay, so here's another chart. Very simple. It's amillennialism, amillennialism. And the difference between amillennialism and premillennialism is that they teach that we are essentially in the millennium now. It's a spiritual millennium. In fact, the millennium isn't even real. There is no thousand-year time. That's just sort of a spiritual or allegorical millennium. And so in some ways, you could say the kingdom of God is now. And then Jesus will return at some time in the future, and we will simply enter the eternal state. There is no future millennium. And by the way, ah, or the a, simply means no. Okay, it means no millennium. There is no literal millennium. Rather, we are in the spiritual millennium now. Now, here's the next chart. 
where you can see from the time of Augustine forward, again, um, well over 300 years uh, into the history of the church, from that point forward, amillennialism became the dominant worldview or the dominant view of the future, the dominant view of history as it's unfolding, and the dominant eschatology of the church. So this is this is profound. This is 11, 12, 1300 years. Amillennialism was the dominant eschatology of the church. Now, you get up to the 1500s, okay? You get up to the 16th century, and we have the Reformation. We all know the story, Martin Luther, everything that has come from that time or since that time. Now, during the Reformation, obviously what happened is the church started returning, the lay leaders in particular really started returning to the scriptures. Shortly thereafter, you had the Gutenberg Press and you know, on and on and on. Next thing you know, the Bible starts becoming available to the average Christian, Christians start studying the Bible. And when they do, they start going, wait a minute, amillennialism is unbiblical. The scriptures are filled with promises that make amillennialism unbiblical, impossible. That's a Greek philosophical perversion of biblical eschatology, of a biblical view of the future in the last days. And so after the Reformation, for the next few hundred years, they were starting to kind of feel their way back to a more biblical a more proper biblical understanding of history and the future. However, that said, for the next few hundred years, I define this period as the age of confusion. What I mean by that is that there's all kinds of different crazy ideas out there. This is so important to understand. They were getting closer, and you have individuals that, as they were leaving behind amillennialism and such a long history of it, starting to return to something more biblical. They started embracing different views such as post-millennialism or sometimes some strange hybrid combinations of different views, okay? So that for the next few hundred years, you have essentially the age of confusion. Now, here's a chart, by the way, if you don't know what post-millennialism is. Post-millennialism is actually very, very similar to amillennialism, except essentially what they believe is that from the time of the ascension, from the time that Jesus ascended to heaven, until the time that he actually comes back, the church started out in persecution, but it's our job as the church, it's our job as individuals to Christianize the world and for us to establish this golden Christian age throughout the world, which is itself essentially the millennium. Our job is to establish a Christian world throughout all of the nations. And so I've got this sort of blue line here in the chart. The idea is that we started out in persecution, but we are moving on toward triumph. We are moving on toward victory. We are moving on toward conquering the world for Jesus. It is a victorious eschatology. It is a triumphalistic eschatology. It is an eschatology in which the cross is no longer something to be embraced. It is no longer a, an instrument of torture for us as individuals to carry. Rather, it is something that Jesus did for us. It is a vending machine whereby we may access all of these various blessings and implement them in order to conquer the world. Okay, so from the time of Constantine, when he allegedly had this vision where he saw up in heaven the sign of the cross and he heard, allegedly, this statement that says, by this sign do conquer, and then he went and he put it on the shields of his Christian armies as they marched into battle to slay and conquer and subdue the pagans, from that point forward, Constantine had a very post-millennial perspective, an idea that we could force Christianity onto the inhabitants of the world. And then, of course, Jesus will return and will enter into the eternal state. So the idea is that we establish the millennial reign, and then after that, Jesus returns post or after the millennium. So that's called post-millennialism. Again, it's really just a, um, a glitzed-up version of amillennialism. You know, as they say, you can put uh, lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, okay? Post-millennialism is basically mitigated. Uh, it's an attempt to clean up some of the problems with amillennialism. It's still profoundly unbiblical.
Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to FAIstudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. So again, here's a chart of church history. The earliest eschatology of the earliest believers closest to the apostles was premillennialism. After the uh, influence of pagan Greek philosophy from the Alexandrian school, from the more Gnostic influence school from the time of Augustine forward, for the next 13 plus hundred years, amillennialism was dominant. And then after the Reformation in the 16th century, for the next few hundred years, is a period where you have various um, reformers that began embracing post-millennialism. Some of them remained amillennialist. And then some started embracing elements of premillennialism. But again, I want to be clear, the period of the Reformation is the period of confusion. It's chaos. It's very similar to today. You know, if you were to say, what do Christians believe about the end times? And you go, well, let me just buy 50 books on Amazon and try to let you know. Let me go on Amazon and watch 50 videos and I'll let you know. And you come away and go, there's an awful lot of different views. And some of them are crazy. Some of them have some commonality. Some of them are out to lunch. Okay, that was the era of, uh, that I've got here in red, again, during the, the years that followed the Reformation. It was fairly chaotic. But again, they were moving gradually toward moving more toward a proper biblical Jewish apocalyptic framework or, as I said, historic premillennialism. Then you had, in the 1830s, something, I'm going to say actually miraculous happened. So in the UK, it was actually in Ireland, you had the birth of a movement called the Plymouth Brethren Movement. And I'm not going to get into the whole history of it. It's really quite fascinating. Um, but it was championed, you know, spearheaded by a man named John Nelson Darby. Darby was, um, by all accounts, a very charismatic, very engaging, um, brilliant individual. Okay, And he came out of the Anglican Church, and he believed that the Anglican Church was completely corrupt, and the real evidence of being devout, being a true believer, is that you come out of the churches. He was trying to get people to gather together in um, more of a, uh, I'll say, a decentralized, sort of almost home group type of uh, movement. And he also was very good with um, conferences. He traveled all over Europe, all over the United States, and he had all kinds of conferences. And he would use these conferences to win people over to his particular view. Now, John Nelson Darby is the first guy who articulated a system of theology. Now, when I say system, that means... It's a series of different beliefs which are all interconnected, and together, all of these beliefs together form what's called dispensationalism. Darby was the primary um, articulator. He was the foundational teacher of, and the first teacher of dispensationalism. Now, again, this is a very specific term that we're going to unpack, but today, to think about this, Today, after this movement, that's the spark that started in the 1830s, roughly half of the church today, I'm just loosely guessing, would call themselves dispensationalists. They would fall into the dispensationalist camp, or they would come under the dispensationalist umbrella. Now, here's what's interesting. Dispensationalism is one of the foundational tenets, one of the elements of belief in dispensationalism is premillennialism. So as much as I disagree, as we'll see, with some elements of dispensationalism, it is and it does represent a recovery of many apostolic truths. It is a return to historic premillennialism, but it has some of its own unique beliefs as well. So again, now here's another chart which sort of gives us a good overview of all of church history. We begin at the beginning. For the first few hundred years, the earliest of the early church writers were primarily dominated by premillennialism. Then you had creeping amillennialism came in. It dominated the church for well over a thousand years. Then you had a few hundred years of confusion. You had a lot of postmillennialists coming out of the Reformation. 
And then from about 200 years ago on, under the influence of John Nelson Darby and many, many others, you have the, um, the rise of dispensationalism, and you have a return, among many, to the historical view, to the early view, to the Jewish view, to the biblical view, which is premillennialism, or again, historical uh, premillennialism. Now, here's a chart of dispensationalism. Now, to be clear, dispensationalism is premillennialism, but the difference is, and one of the primary hallmarks, one of the primary distinctive beliefs within dispensationalism that makes it different than historical premillennialism is the belief in a pre-tribulational rapture. So here you can see that you have the ascension of Jesus over on the left of the chart, and then you have the idea that the church goes up and meets Jesus as he comes halfway down, meets the church in the clouds, and then he does a U-turn, or as we say in Boston, he bangs a U-E, he bounces back up like a boomerang back up to heaven, and we go with him and stay there for seven years. And then seven years later, he comes back, and then he establishes the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of the Messiah, etc. So you can see here, it's a slight variation on historical premillennialism because it includes the pre-tribulational rapture. Now, we're not going to get into all of the reasons just yet for the pre-tribulational rapture, but it's very important for us just to see it. Now, what is dispensationalism? Okay, first of all, dispensationalism, and the word, by the way, dispensation, dispensation just means period. It just means a time period. It's a dispensation. And it was a term that John Nelson Darby used quite a lot, and it becomes belief in the, 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 the belief that history is divided up between different dispensations wherein God deals with people differently in each dispensation, that becomes one of the foundational beliefs of dispensational premillennialism, okay, or dispensationalism. But first of all, I, I need to state that it is a theological system. It's not just premillennialism. It's a system of interconnected doctrines. Now, again, it was first taught. You will not find dispensationalism ever taught as a system in church history until the 1830s. And this is so important. You'll find um, elements of dispensationalist belief throughout church history, but altogether as a system, you will absolutely never find dispensationalism taught in church history until the 1830s. That is unarguable. That's beyond, like that point is beyond debate, okay? Like, this would be like trying to say, no, Islam existed for thousands of years before Muhammad, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, Watchtower Theology, it existed long before Charles Taze Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, Charles Taze Russell is the one that articulated and created Watchtower Theology. Yes, you can find various elements of Watchtower or Jehovah's Witness Theology in church history. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses are Aryans. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe he's just a man, that he's sort of an exalted prophet. Well, you can find abundant Arianism, which is a heresy, throughout church history, but that doesn't mean that Watchtower theology is ancient, because Watchtower theology, yes, it draws from different ideas that we do find in church history, but then it adds a bunch of its own unique, distinct ideas. Dispensationalism is no different. It's no different. Muslims always claim that Islam is the foundational, ancient, primordial religion. They'll say Jesus was a Muslim, Moses was a Muslim, all of the uh, Old Testament saints or prophets were Muslims, they'll say. And they'll say Islam, for what it is worth, is basically monotheism. And I go, yeah, you can find monotheism long before Muhammad, but what Muhammad brought was very specific. It had very unique doctrines, distinct doctrines. It's not just monotheism. It's Islam. Islam never existed before Muhammad. Muhammad is the founder of Islam. John Nelson Darby is the founder of dispensationalism. That point is unarguable. Any attempt to say dispensationalism came before Darby is anachronistic. It's it's basically the same as trying to say Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witness theology existed long before uh, 
before the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's just, it's nonsensical, okay? None of them had a time machine. So since the time of John Nelson Darby, dispensationalism has taken various forms and um, it's, it's gone through a lot of evolution, okay? So today, leading, th well, of course, these guys have passed on, but today, leading theologians like Charles Ryrie um, or John Feinberg, and today, um, another excellent scholar is a guy named Michael Vlack. Um, he's a fantastic author, great teacher, just all around pleasant guy, and he's a progressive dispensationalist. They define dispensationalism similarly, but they actually have different definitions, now, as just a super simple overview of some of the different kinds of dispensationalism, first you had Darby, and then he had his assistant, Cyrus Schofield, C.I. Schofield, the author of the Schofield Reference Bible. These were the two primary founders, if you will, of dispensationalism, and then later you had a guy named Lewis, um, Lewis Perry Chafer. Do I have that right? Lewis Perry Chafer. And he was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, um, also sort of a classic dispensationalism after the pattern of Darby and Schofield. Well, then during the late 1800s, you also had some really radical dispensationalists, such as B.W. Newton, and then he has a whole bunch of others that followed after him. And these guys are sometimes called hyper-dispensationalists. Okay, well then later, um, recognizing a lot of the problems with this particular system of theology, men like Charles Ryrie refined, uh, and this is what's called revised dispensationalism. They cleaned up. They tried to mitigate some of the problems with dispensationalism. So men like Charles Ryrie, John Feinberg, they taught what, what is often called revised dispensationalism. And then moving forward in history today, you even have, again, men like Michael Vlack, um, there's a whole host of really fantastic, excellent uh, scholars that embrace what's called progressive dispensationalism. And this is really where they're trying to get away from a lot of the, um, the errors and excesses of classic dispensationalism. I may have l just lost some of you there. The point is there's a lot of different ideas under the same umbrella um, of dispensationalism. But again, today, a lot of really good progressive dispensationalists, many of whom would actually say, no, Joel, you are a progressive dispensationalist. So men like Craig Blazing, as I said, Michael Vlock, um, Daryl Bach. Um, yeah, Daryl Bach versus Daniel Block. I always get those two confused. In fact, I'm going to edit my notes here because I misspelled his name. Um, so these guys are some of the most recognizable names. Now... I'm going to put this chart up here. What is dispensationalism? And these are some of the primary ideas that make up dispensationalism. So it has more of a literal or what's called a historical grammatical hermeneutic, which is to say it interprets the Bible literally wherever possible. Now, that's not to say that when the Bible uses figurative poetry that it goes, no, that's literal. It's, it reads the text through the lens of what I call rational literalism. This is the way that all language works. If you get to know me, I jump from being very serious to telling jokes, to being sarcastic, to being silly, to being cynical, like whatever, to using expressions. But as you get to know me in my cult, you go, oh, he's joking there. Oh, I see the smirk on his face. He's not really, or he's mixing a little bit. This is like... No one takes every single thing I say literally, but no one takes every single thing I say as a joke. No one takes every single thing I say as sarcasm. Rather, you get to know me, you get to know when I'm using you know, various expressions and when I'm just speaking very straightforwardly. That's the lens of what's called rational literalism. That's how all people communicate. That's how, the Bi that's how we interpret the Bible. It's filled with poetry and allegory and different things, but when it's historical narrative, it should be read as historical narrative. When it makes a promise, it should be read as a literal promise. Now, sometimes the literal and the allegorical or the symbolic are mixed a bit, just like when I shift from being serious to being silly. Sometimes there's a bit of a mixture, right? But that is sort of the approach to reading the Bible. We don't read the Bible allegorically, okay? So that is one distinctive feature of dispensationalism. 
um, you have a very strong emphasis on the biblical covenants, which is to say the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, etc., etc., etc. These are God's promises, and they define God's unfolding promise plan. So dispensationalism places great uh, emphasis on the biblical covenants. Now, many of those in the church that embrace what's called Reformed theology, they, t- they tend to focus on covenants that are not even in the Bible. They'll say, well, this is God's covenant of grace or you know, this type of thing, and they have created an entire different framework that's extra-biblical, quite frankly, and oftentimes they minimize and they don't emphasize the actual biblical covenants. So this is a very good thing. Dispensationalism emphasizes the biblical covenants. It also has, I say here that it begins with the Old Testament, which is to say that it has Old Testament priority. Hello everyone, Gabe here from The Wire. Wanted to make sure that you're all aware of a very special event that we have coming up. In less than two months, FAI will be hosting the Maranatha End Times Summit in Dallas, Texas. That will be three days of amazing speakers, good times, good food, great fellowship, and lots of wonderful things for everyone to do. Bring the kids, bring the family, bring the dog, bring your appetite for God's word and for some good Texas barbecue. Love you all. Maranatha. Okay, this is very simple, and I've made this point a thousand times. I used to build houses. When we built houses, we built, we had the foundation poured first. Then we built the floor, then we built the walls, and then we put the roof on last. We didn't build the roof first, okay? Many Christians today, they have a New Testament priority. They begin with the New Testament, and then they use the New Testament to sort of reverse engineer their understanding and interpretation of the Old Testament. That's not how you do it. You begin with the foundation. You begin with Genesis. You begin with the Torah. You begin with the books of Moses. Then you move forward. The prophets are primarily calling Israel to pay attention to Moses, to be faithful to the writings of the revelation of God in the five books of Moses, in the Pentateuch, right? And then comes the New Testament, the apostles, Jesus, John the Baptist, right? These guys are simply reading and studying and building upon what the prophets have already said. And Moses, of course, being the greatest, according to the scriptures, of all of the prophets, Okay, so this is kind of the way, this is the way the Bible was revealed. This is the way we understand the Bible. The New Testament does not cause us to radically reinterpret the Old Testament. No matter what N.T. Wright says, the New Testament does not abrogate, undermine, or reimagine the Old Testament. It does not change. God does not change his words. It expands, it opens up, it gives further insight and understanding at times. Jesus does rebuke and abrogate popular misinterpretations of the Old Testament, but never does the New Testament override, undo, replace, or supersede the Old Testament. So dispensationalism has an Old Testament priority. That's how it interprets the Bible. And I agree with that. That's wonderful. Uh, And then dispensationalism, as I said, it has this very strong belief that history is divided up between different periods or dispensations. And for what it's worth, I basically agree with that. Now, different dispensationalists have different views. Some have seven different dispensations or periods. Others say, no, there's only three or four. Like, there's quite a range of different views, but they all basically believe that there are different periods of history. The millennium, for example, that would be a new era, a new dispensation. I don't really have any problem at all with the idea that history is broken up into different periods, you know, before the flood, after the flood, before the law, after the law, before the first coming, after the first coming, this type of thing. Then you have the three unique, distinct doctrines of dispensationalism. It sees a very rigid distinction and separation between Israel and the church. Now, this is unarguably the most technical aspect of discussing dispensationalism or the various spectrums of belief within dispensationalism as it moves up into progressive reform theology, reform theology, and um, ultimately supersessionism and this type of thing. So on one side of the spectrum is the idea that God used to deal with Israel, but now he has replaced Israel with the church, and the church is the new and true Israel. 
Dispensationalism rejects replacement theology, that's good, but they make, as I said, a very rigid distinction between Israel and the church. Now, I would hold that while there are some clear distinctions, there are also some profound overlaps. There's not just this harsh wall of division. You're either in the church or part of Israel. No, there's actually profound overlap, almost a blending of one into the other, and the view that I hold is best articulated by what's called olive tree theology. Okay, we've been sort of grafted into a previous project that God is affecting and unfolding with Israel. But we're also, as Gentiles, if we're not Jewish, we're part of the project, but yet we're distinct. And so the primary issue that the New Testament focuses on, that Paul focused on, was not the distinction between Israel and the church. It was rather the coming together of Jew and Gentile among believers in the church, both Jews and Gentiles, as one new man. That's the primary paradigm and focus of the New Testament. Now, because, okay, now please hear this. This is very important. Because dispensationists believe there is such a strong, clear difference. There are promises made to Israel that are not made to the church, etc. Dispensationalists all believe, please hear me on this, that the New Testament is divided up between portions that are for the Jews and portions that are for the church. In fact, dispensationalists teach that the Gospels are all for Israel because they came before the church, that Jesus was teaching the Jews, okay? And then there are portions of Paul's letters and so on and so forth that are for the church. So you'll always hear dispensationalists say, you go, Matthew 24 says the rapture happens after the tribulation. They go, that's not for the church, that's for Israel. You go, so none of these warnings, none of these exhortations are for us. No, that's not for us. That doesn't apply to us. It says, you know, he will gather together his elect. Yeah, that's Israel, that's not us. And you go, wow, that's, this is a weird doctrine. And quite frankly, it is very similar to Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses actually do the same thing. They break up the New Testament. They say some sections are just for the 144,000, this this unique special group, and then the rest of the scriptures or other portions are for the great multitude. So they divide the New Testament up between sections that are for the, uh, what they call the anointed class, and then the rest of the New Testament is for the great multitude. Okay, it's very cultic. Dispensationalism, which interestingly came out of the same century, out of this same period of incredibly apocalyptic uh, American history. You also had the Millerites, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, they all came out of this period. Dispensationalism has, quite frankly, a very cultic um, way of interpreting the New Testament, where large sections of it don't apply to us. They're not for us. Now, within dispensationalism, you have different groups. You have one group that's called mid-acts. So these guys believe that, okay, so classic dispensationalists believe that the church was birthed at Pentecost. And they go, so anything before Pentecost is for Israel. Anything written after Pentecost, that's for the church. That's how you should rightly divide the New Testament. That's what they say, rightly divide the scriptures. Some's for us, some's not for us. Then you have the mid-Acts guys, and these guys will say, well, some of Paul's letters are not for us because they were written before the church began, all right? And then others, you know, after a certain point, they are for us. Then you even have E.W. Bullinger, and these are the hyper-dispensationalists. They say the church technically wasn't formed until after Acts 28, they literally will say that most of the New Testament is not for the church. I mean, it's like, you go, I've never heard this. You go, trust me, they're out there. There are people that believe this, and many of them are very widely known teachers. It's very, very cultic. It's a very weird, cultic way of interpreting the New Testament. And it robs the church, quite frankly, of massive portions of the Bible. and saying, well, that's not for me. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to pay attention to that because it's not for me. It's a very dangerous perspective. And then as a result of this drastic difference between Israel and the church, dispensationalism also teaches the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Now, this is very important. The pre-tribulational rapture is nowhere explicitly, clearly taught in any verse in the Bible. 
But dispensationalists say, but it's inferred. And you go, how is it inferred? They go, well, you have to understand dispensationalism. You have to understand that God in one dispensation was dealing with Israel. But now in the last days, he's dealing with the mystery of the church, the age of grace. But for a brief little seven-year period, he, it's, in other words, unless you understand this incredibly convoluted, cockamamie um, worldview called dispensationalism, you're not going to see pre-tribulationism in the scriptures. And in order to remove the church from the picture, because dispensationalists teach that God only deals one way with one people at any given time, and then there's a different dispensation, because they say the Lord is returning to deal with Israel in the last seven years, he has to remove the church. Thus, you have the pre-tribulational rapture. It was a necessary part of the story to make the system work. It's nowhere taught in the scriptures but it's necessary to make the system of dispensationalism work. Now, what I've done here in this next slide is I've shown you the seven interlocking doctrines that together make up the system of dispensationalism. Now, to be clear, these are not all just separate, distinct doctrines. They are integrally interconnected, intertwined, and dependent on one another. One idea logically leads to the next. They're all connected. And this is why I make it so clear. Dispensationalism is a system. Okay? Now, let's go ahead and just define the difference between dispensational premillennialism and historical premillennialism. What's the difference? Historical premillennialism is way, way, way older than Darbyism. As we've already seen, it is the view of the apostles and the earliest of the early Christians, undeniably, unarguably. Historical premillennialism also, it shares many of the commonalities with dispensationalism, but it rejects the last three distinct doctrines that I highlighted. It rejects the doctrines which make dispensationalism unique and different from early premillennialism or simple premillennialism. Historical premillennialism rejects the overly rigid separation between Israel and the church. It rejects this idea of dividing the New Testament up into sections for the church and sections for the Israel. And it rejects the pre-tribulational rapture. So I've got another uh, slide here, which is to say dispensationalism believes all seven of these ideas but the three that make dispensationalism distinct are, as I said, the overly rigid separation between Israel and the church, the idea that the New Testament should be broken up into different sections, and the pre-tribulational rapture. So what I'm saying and the purpose of this whole session is to say, guys, why do people like Daryl Bach, Michael Vlack, Craig Blazing, why do they say they are progressive dispensationalists? Why don't they simply call themselves historical premillennialists? Why maintain the baggage, the insanity, the errors, the very cultic um, doctrines that were taught by Darby when we can say, let's just go back to the teachings of those that lived closest to the apostles? And yes, there are elements that have been refined. There's no question that dispensationalism has helped premillennial, premillennialism refine and get better. There's no question about that. But let's just dump the moniker dispensationalism, forget it, way too much baggage, and let's return to terms that are far more rooted in history, such as apostolic or historical premillennialism. Let's get rid of these three weird doctrines, and let's embrace the other doctrines which are common to premillennialism. And so again, here I have a chart of church history. As you can see, the earliest of the early church writers were premillennialists. Today, much of the church, those who are premillennialists today, are dominated by dispensationalism. That said, I've got one final chart that I want to end here. Before the return of Jesus, the church is going to return. It's going to become mature, as it says, in Ephesians 4, the church is going to attain the maturity, the full stature of the man Christ Jesus. There is a maturity coming to his martyr church in these last days, and they will recover. They will reclaim 
Jewish apocalypticism. They will reclaim the views that were believed and embraced by Jesus, by John the Baptist, by John the Baptist's father, by the apostles, and that was apostolic premillennialism or Jewish apocalypticism. And the church before the return of Jesus, which is on our very near horizon, will leave behind the errors, the weirdness of dispensationalism. And it's for this reason that I'm saying dispensationalism must die. Dispensationalism has many beliefs that are good. Let's retain those. Let's remain premillennialists, okay? Let's leave behind the corruption of Greek Platonic philosophy. Let's reject amillennialism. Let's reject the Gnostic errors of post-millennialism. Let's return to the biblical model, which is Jewish apocalypticism and premillennialism, and let us cast aside every error like a filthy rag. And so it's for this reason that before the return of Jesus, the church will reclaim the Maranatha cry for his return. They will reclaim a proper biblical premillennialism. So that is my summary of what dispensationalism is and why it must die. So much of what we're doing here um, on the FAI app, on our YouTube channels, teaching, is we are trying to help the church recover a biblical framework for history as it's unfolding, a biblical framework for the future, a biblical eschatology, because that is what our hope is rooted in. That is what we're, like, that's what the gospel is rooted in. The, the, the golden carrot, if you will, or the bait on the hook, or the reward at the end of the finish line is probably a better analogy. That's what we're laying our lives down for. That's what we are enduring for, is the reward, the inheritance, the promises that await us on the other side of the day of the Lord. So I trust this was helpful. Um, I needed to lay all of this out because, as I said in next week's session, I'm going to debunk um, a couple of these books. I'm going to critique them. Let's just put it that way. I'm not going to... Debunk's probably a... um, probably a jerky term, but I'm going to debunk many claims that are made in these books, and we're going to survey them and review them, and then actually jump into um, the third book, which, as I said, is much more um, balanced, responsible. It's actually an excellent book, other than the portion so far from what I've read, um, where William Watson contributes. So it was necessary that we lay some of this foundation. So looking forward to jumping into those issues with you next week. Until then, guys, God bless you all. Have a great week and Maranatha.